We are very pleased and honored to be joined now by Robert F. Kennedy Jr., obviously a presidential candidate for the Democratic Party, uh, former environmental lawyer and activist, and maybe some say still is. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Brian, for having me. Sure. This is CNBC. So we're going to give a CNBC interview. We're going to talk about the issues that matter to our audience, which is business, the economy, markets, maybe a little international relations, energy, et cetera. I'm going to start off with this very simple question. Finish this sentence. The American economy right now is what? Uh, in trouble. Why? A lot of the economic data is good. Consumer spending is good. Yeah, I'm over $33 trillion in debt. Um, and... Uh, and you, we have two presidential candidates who are saying they brought prosperity to this country, but you've got 57 percent of the American people who cannot put their hands on a thousand dollars if they have an emergency. And for those people, the engine light goes on in their car and it's like the apocalypse happened. It's the end of the world for them. Um, we have now kids can't afford houses. Uh, the housing price has gone from two hundred thousand dollars. $215,000 two years ago to 400000 today. You know, I have seven kids who are in the range 20 to 35, and almost none of their friends are buying houses. That was part of the, the American dream, that if you worked hard, you pay, played by the rules, you could afford a house, you could take a summer vacation, you could put money, you could raise a family, put money aside for retirement, and, and that was with one job, and that's yeah. not happening. Well, now anymore. it's about, I think it's about, I think you tweeted about this, about half the country, the median income is below... Is $5,000 Less than below. the cost of living. Right. So, so now, you basically have to have two jobs. You have to have two jobs, and you... And that's, but how do we do... Well, how do we, and you said your economic plan is going to fix that. How do we fix that? Because this seems structural over structural. years or decades. Even. Yeah. And well, number one, we have to unravel the warfare business, the warfare machine. That is bankrupting our country. That, and you know, Paul Kennedy, who's the Yale historian, did a, uh, uh, has done this extraordinary history on the decline of empires. And, and every empire in the last 500 years, its death knell was overextending its military abroad. We've spent $8 trillion on wars over the past 20 years, since 2002, that have gotten us nothing, that have made it less safe to be an American, less our country less safe. The Chinese spent $8 trillion during that same period while we were bombing bridges, ports, roads, schools, universities, hospitals. They were building them, and they're now the principal creditor for almost every nation in Latin America and every country, virtually every country in Africa, they, we, the, our wars have now you know, not only bankrupted the middle class in this country. If we, How about the, t tie the war to the middle class? Because that's where I'm, you're, uh, you're losing me a little bit. And I understand def straight defense spending. Anything we spend on defense is not going to be spent on something else. And I think on your yeah. proposal, you want to dramatically cut the Department of Defense spending. Yeah, by hundreds I, of billions. Yeah, I, I, you know, when we were told in 1992 that we were going to cut it from 660 billion because we were going to get yeah, the peace the fall dividend, of the Soviet dividend, Union, uh, we're going to have peace we, time, the we peace were told dividend. That we were going to cut it to 200 billion, and that would give us enough money to arm ourselves to the teeth at home, make ourselves too expensive to ever invade, and then start reinvesting that intellectual capital and the you know, currency capital back into building an industrial base in this country, and it never happened. Instead of going to $200 billion, we went to $1.3 trillion. We, we spend more on our military than the next 10 nations combined, and it's not making our country richer. It's making us poorer. So how would cutting the defense budget help the middle class? Well, in a number of different ways. I mean, first of all, we're going to lower our deficits. We're going to, we, we can bring a lot of that money home. I mean, if we hadn't spent that $8 trillion, Brian, we could extend the life of uh, solvency for Social Security loan for, for 30 years. We could pay for university educations for every child in America. We could pay off the credit debt, card debt in our country um, for individuals. Uh, we could uh, so, so take the DOD spending cuts. This is primary to your economic plan. Transfer that money into other things. Yeah, but I mean that's not the only thing I want to do. I have a number of direct programs for that that are common sense programs 
that will begin restoring the middle class in this country in dramatic ways. Okay, what, what's another one? Well, one of them is to create, you know, the, one of the big problems, one of the reasons that the price of housing has gone up and nobody can get a house anymore. People make an offer on a house and then somebody comes in with a cash offer. Of, uh, so a lot of these are big institutions, by the they're way. Big Wall they're big institutions. Wall Street firms. Rock, Vanguard, State Street. Buying up hundreds of thousands uh, of homes. Uh, right. Their, their objective now, they own 88% of the S&P 500. Now they're targeting single-family homes. They're competing with our kids, and they have these big bank books. So they're, the cost of money and mortgages to them is minuscule, and our kids now have to compete with them. And, you know, Thomas Jefferson said American democracy has to be based on independent freehold ownership of independent freeholds by tens of thousands of, of American citizens, each with a stake in our system of government. We're now moving back to a feudal system. Yeah, where we but how, well, what do we do about it, Mr. Okay, Kennedy? Well, do we, do we, do we make you, it illegal for no. insert big Wall Street bank name well, here to buy you, up mass amounts of property? You change the tax code to make it um, more difficult for large corporations to accumulate thousands of houses. But here, here's a, a direct program. If you have a rich uncle um, you, who will co-sign your mortgage, you can get a much lower rate because the bank is basing it on his, yeah. you know, the, his credit rating rather than yours. So I'm going to give everybody a rich uncle, which is Uncle Sam, who will guarantee mortgages at uh, for single first-time single-family home buyers at three percent interest. That will reduce the average price of mortgage by a thousand dollars a month. I will finance that not by increasing our debt, which I'm not going to do but rather by selling tax-free 3% bonds to finance it. That will allow, you know, the, the, we have... I'm, I'm hearing shades of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac in my head, yeah. though. This is where, and they run into their own problems. We've covered well, they, yeah. How would your plan be different than what currently exists? Well, we have now surpluses in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Oh, and that would be, you know, that we, I could tie those those institutions into this program. But we need this program. We had, you know, we had 50 years of prosperity in this country after World War II. Economists and social scientists call it the great prosperity. The middle, American we were middle the only class, manufacturer of size because we, we obliterated right. Japan and Europe. Europe right. was obliterated and we obliterated Japan. And the, also the American middle class became the greatest economic engine in the history of mankind. We owned half the wealth on the face of the earth. And but the big boom took off after World War II when we got every and we got Americans into houses, uh, with the GI Bill and a number of other bills that made it cheap for Americans to purchase a house at low interest rates. And that was yeah. kind of the beginning of this impetus that made us so wealthy. Would you raise taxes on people making under four hundred thousand a year? No, I would not. I'm not going to raise taxes. I, I'm not going to raise taxes. I don't think that that's the right thing to do right now. I think we really need to stimulate our economy. Um, another thing that I'm going to do is to create, um, I, is, is, and this is a, a program that we announced this week, and it's a program that my uncle, uh, Ted Kennedy, John McCain, originally advanced in 2007, and then it was advanced by a number of the civil rights leaders, including Andrew Young and a number of others, for a whole lot of reasons. A very good idea to make passport, passport cards free. So uh, one, of the, you know, one, of the, uh, one of the big penalties against being working poor in this country is that a lot of the working poor do not have a federal, a federal photo ID. And under the Patriot Act, the banks are, are, have all of these provisos that make them uh, investigate your ID. So, and, and they don't want to handle small accounts from poor people. So, so they, to cut the cost for people. You're trying to well, lower no, well, costs what, what, for what, working it, class families. It will do a number of things. One, it will solve the immigration crisis. Because what, which is another huge depressant on on wages and on the welfare of the single of the middle class in this country. For the first time, we will have a federal ID. Every American can get this now for free from their local post office. There's 33,000 folk post offices in this country. It will clear up some of the problems with the voting system, so everybody will be able to show an ID to vote. 
you won't right now if you're on, if you're at a construction site here in New York or you and I were talking earlier about Nashville. The only ID that is required for most construction sites is a social security card. Those have no ID, no photo on them. They can be easily fabricated. They are passed from person to person. They depress. They make. They penalize union membership because the non-union sites uh, who are taking fake yeah. IDs from people can now, you know, pay. And with this huge influx of immigrants, they're now paying five, six dollars an hour to people who are willing to work for that because there's no other jobs they can get. And if you had an ID that was that everybody had, yeah. That, but you understand that I mean, people. When you start talking about that, they start to get government tracking. They start talking about this is discriminatory. Yeah, this, this is. This, what about the yeah, people that are already here? Do this, they get the path to citizenship and the path to work? Every this is the this is a barrier against government tracking. It puts out of it. It um, it ends the arguments that people say that we need vaccine passports and medical passports and and mandatory obligatory government ID. It's government ID if you want it, but it becomes available. There are many people like in New York City. Yeah, in poor so it's not mandatory to the plan. Not okay. mandatory. Okay. It just becomes available for free to anybody who wants yeah. it. Yeah, we, we've got we've got running out of time, but there's a number of the quick topics I'd like to just kind of power through if I could, Mr. Kennedy. Yeah. Uh, you said in 2017, I think it was a sold out. Uh, event in New Paltz, New York. We need a new energy economy. All right, you're an environmental lawyer and activist. What do you think of the Inflation Reduction Act? Uh, I don't like this. Isn't that the new energy economy that you uh, spoke of no, six I years ago? I think that the Inflation Reduction Act was hijacked by industry, by particularly the carbon industry. That you know, carbon capture, which is there's 173 billion dollars in subsidies in that act for carbon capture. We need free market capitalism. And we need to end the subsidies to the uh, carbon industry. Listen, right now, you can build a solar plant in this country. Capital costs of a solar plant are about a billion dollars a gigawatt. A coal plant is three point six billion dollars a gigawatt. So, and a, a nuke plant is fourteen billion a gigawatt. Yeah, but a nuke is always on. No, it isn't. There's a, there are the nuclear is always on. No, 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 no. no they're, 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 they have more maintenance outages with nuclear power plants than almost any other sector. You, you do have maintenance. You'll have some water issues. I agree, but well, for the most part, but if it's 40, fusion, listen, you can you can, is the sun. Well, we don't have fusion. Well, okay, fission, fusion. You get my. I wish we did have cold fusion. By the way, we could create limitless energy, and there are some well, yeah, encouraging. Of course, there are was, some encouraging little. Uh, you know, science programs. Yeah, but we there. don't have that. I what mean, is your view on nuclear power? Uh, my view is that I'm all for it if they ever make it safe and if they ever make it uh, 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 economic. You can make, we can make energy by burning prime rib. But, you know, but why wouldn't we take, take the cheapest form of energy? energy, energy can, right? <laughs> you know, why wouldn't we take the cheapest form of energy possible? So what do we do? What's the new energy economy then? Wind, solar, get yeah, rid of the subsidies kind of, for the carbon capture. Get rid of the subsidies. Oh. There's 5.2 trillion dollars in subsidies annually for carbon. There are small subsidies, uh, relatively small, for wind and solar. Um, but, you know, we have an abundant and other geothermal, et cetera. What about the oil industry here in the United States? Energy independence. We, we've learned. Europe has shown us if you don't have a steady supply of, of relatively inexpensive energy, you're in big trouble. Germany, I probably saw the New York Times piece yesterday. They're in big trouble in part, not only because of, but in part because of high energy we costs. Up, we blew up their pipeline. Well, and, I, 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 I don't want to go down that road because no. that hasn't been proven. Well, yeah, but I mean, the war, the, 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 the pipeline was blown up. And the war right. in Ukraine, and, which is was and, an unnecessary war from the beginning. Fair, fair and, and, and pipelines have been shut off. Some right. have been blown up. And there's some sanctions, have been shut off. And the sanctions, which are part of that whole, you know, war. And I, let me tell you but something I think we else. learned the risk of being attached to foreign energy sources. Oh, so where would that. U.S. oil and gas. I, I agree with that. Where would U.S. oil and gas fall in the, in the Kennedy administration's, because you're an environmental guy as yeah. well. Plan, and also, do you have a view on OPEC? Well, right now, I mean, <laughs> you asked me two huge questions there. Trying, <laughs> running out of time, I'm a trying. View on, a view on OPEC. I mean, the the thing that we should be worried about right now is BRICS, and BRICS is going to own OPEC, and that is because we've weaponized, you know, because of our war ideology has has driven the acceleration of BRICS, and now you've got. 
BRICS IS REPRESENTING, uh, I THINK, 47% of the world's population and uh, and 37% of GDP and but they they now with BRICS 11 you have Russia, Saudi Arabia, yep. Venezuela which control OPEC. So 90% of the energy is going to be I uh, you, you I think you might have read my mind since I have no notes which is that was my final <laughs> or close to final question was was going to be about China. Okay, and particularly you've got the US Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo over there. <laughs> But I want to get your views on China. But you talked about BRICS. So if our viewers aren't familiar, Brazil, Russia, India, China, plus South America or uh, South Africa, they're expanding. Well, now, they now they're expanding eat, right. the group dramatically. Right. It feels like kind of a huge. Uh, we talked and about and on my show last week. It's an alternative to the dollar as the, as the world reserve currency. So what, what, would you, what would a Kennedy administration do to counter that growing counterweight that clearly is being run mostly by China. Well, nobody wanted to start BRICS. Nobody wanted an alternative to the U.S. dollar. This happened because of our weaponization of the U.S. dollar and weaponization of our foreign policy, unilateral weaponization, and the weaponization of our control of the, of the world currency. We, we were impounding people's, um, you know, their personal assets yep, yep. if the government misbehaved and do it uh, unilaterally. So we created it. We need to de-escalate our, you know, our, our violence around the world, which has driven the creation of BRICS. And, 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 you know, the answer to your question about China, China does not want a war with the United States. We spend three times on our, on our military what they do. We have 800 bases abroad. They have one and a half. They're not like they want to compete with us. They want to bury us. But they want to do it on an economic playing field, and they need us. You know, they cannot survive without us. We're, we're, I'm their, not, we're their marketplace. In uh, right. We are and their, we're the am, biggest buyer right. of Chinese goods by far. Right. Walmart. So I'm not afraid of the United States competing with China head to head in countries around the world. I think that's good for us. I think we win that competition because we have freedom. What about in this US, What about Nike, Apple, U.S. companies doing business there? If you were going to give advice to Tim Cook of Apple, what would it be? Well, uh, giving economic advice or, you know, patriotic advice. How about doing business in China? I, I don't, I'm not somebody who thinks that we should divide the world, or live on one planet, that should, we should divide the world into, you know, into uh, different sectors. I think the shared markets are ultimately good for the world because they, they decrease the chance of war. And that ultimately is okay. the greatest threat. And I am not frightened. About, I think the U.S. policy should always be, we should, the government policy should be about, uh, about fostering, developing, nurturing the middle class in this country. And that's what U.S. Yeah. policy. But I'm not, I don't think we should cut off trade with China. I think some of the things that are being done, for example, um, you know, the programs to bring uh, a semiconductor. The uh, CHIPS Act. The CHIPS Act, I, you know, I don't like the fact that we're giving subsidies to the richest kind of companies in the world, but I do think it's prudent to be able to make semiconductors here in the United States. And I'd like to see more of that, you know, trying to bring the industry home. Yeah. Um, but I'm not, you know, I don't, I don't think we should be rattling the sabers at, uh, with China. When you, when you treat somebody as an adversary, they tend to become one. And we did the same thing with China. And there are a group of people in the State Department White House who want constant pipeline of new wars to feed the military industrial two, complex. Two final, nation. Two, I'd be driving our foreign policy. Two final questions, Mr. Kennedy. Number one, um, this is a little bit out on crypto. Uh, should we back 10 percent of U.S. government debt with cryptocurrency? I mean, we're off the gold standard 50 well, years now. Okay, 10 percent. You mean like or a selling, number? I, you mean selling T bills with um, that backed are, by crypto or any U.S. I, government you know obligation? I not uh, backed by gold, but by the new, the dig, I guess the digital gold. Yeah. I mean, right now, I I like the idea of having some attachment to a base currency for at least some portion of the T bills out there. I think it enforces discipline. Mm -hmm. in the, against you know just printing money endlessly so and that um, and that individuals and governments etc when they buy T bills can get you know my uncle did this in 1963 with silver certificates and gold certificates he yeah. tried to return an, at least an option for base currency rather than fiat currency which is you know which is 
destroyed the middle yeah. class in this country. It's become a, I know, did not ask the question by accident, Mr. King. <laughs> <laughs> Final question, and and you know I, I'm gonna I leave I leave the politics to a lot of the other people and 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 also some other issues that you may be familiar with that I think you've been asked a billion times. But I want to end on on this note because I think it was yesterday or two days ago. There was an AP poll showed that 77 percent of Americans felt that. Mr. Biden, President Biden, was, was too old to serve another term, including 69 percent of Democrats. Now, whatever you may think of that, the Democratic National Committee has said that there will not be a primary debate, which I understand. Historically, incumbents do not face primary challengers or debates generally. I have a feeling I know what you're going to say, but make the case to the DNC for having a debate, one debate between you, any other candidate, and President Biden in front of the American people to maybe assuage some concerns. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the point, that there's a lot of misgivings now among a vast majority of both Republicans and Democrats about the president's capacity as mental And again, I want to be clear, this is not my, this yeah, is not my I, thought. I, this is AP poll, 69% yeah, of Democrats. Yeah, so um, I think it's important for the president to have, um, to have a debate to show that, you know, this is a rigorous job, to show that he has the vigor, that he has the mental acuity, and to put those misgivings aside with the American people, but not only a debate, to have unscripted uh, 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 conversations with voters and to do some retail politics. Now, now, you know, if he's gonna have to debate President Trump or whoever the Republican is at some point, and to you know to say that it, it you know to, that he should sit on the couch now it's like preparing for you know telling a prize fighter you got to prepare for this for the you know the prize fight the championship by sitting on a couch and eating Chick Fil A you know you we should they, you need to be Sounds practicing delicious, by the way <laughs> <laughs> you need to be practicing and um and you know you need and and uh, and getting on your feet and getting on your toes and um, and making sure that Are you, you talking to him about getting one? Is there any chance that there would be a debate? Well, we're asking him for yeah. one. Yeah. And I think the American people and even Democrats uh, who don't like me particularly because they or because they don't, you know, because they've been misled about what I believe about certain things. Um, but uh, but I, even all, virtually all Democrats want to see a debate. No. Yeah. Well, I enjoyed having an unscripted conversation with you, Mr. Kennedy. It was, uh, you know, this kind of, I could have done an hour, but I appreciate you spending about 20 minutes with us and going through a variety of topics. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, sir. Thanks, really Brian. appreciate it. Robert F. Kennedy, Jr., Democratic candidate for president.